Hi, Silver Rain Running Cloud here with What It Takes to Be Great. My guest today is Carl E. Douglas, probably the most famous attorney in the entire world. Yes, indeed. And he's going to be talking to us today about what it takes to be great. Welcome, Carl. How are you today? Silver, I'm blessed and highly favored. Thank you so much for having me. You don't look a day over 21 when I last saw you from college. <laughs> you are too kind. You were really too kind. Thank you so much. Well, listen, you're a living legend, Carl. When Thank I you so met much. you, I had no idea you would become a living legend. I mean, I knew you were special. I knew you were special, but I didn't know you'd become a living legend. What does it feel like to be a living legend? You know, I don't think of myself as a living legend, Silver. I was fortunate to work with Johnny Cochran for 12 and a half years. He, to me, is a legend. And to just be able to learn from him and to follow in his footsteps is all that I've ever asked of life. I've been lucky to be blessed. I've been lucky to have worked on some of the biggest cases in both the civil and the criminal arena, but I wouldn't call myself a living legend yet. Well, you're pretty, you're pretty modest. Um, and I, I think that that's too, too, very admirable. Um, everyone mostly knows you for the OJ case. And you actually had movies made representing your character from that case. But that wasn't your first big case, Carl. Your first big case was a personal injury case that came in at the highest amount that had ever been seen. Isn't that right? Well, you know, it's really reversed, Silver. The OJ trial was in 1995. I left Johnny Cochran's office in 1998. And then in 1999, I was one of six lawyers representing the family of Patricia Anderson. We were involved in a lawsuit against General Motors and we argued that General Motors had designed a 1994 Chevrolet Malibu in such a way knowing that it was a dangerous design. You see, in those days, the gas tank on the Chevy Malibu was positioned just 11 inches behind the rear bumper. On a, on a fateful night in 1994, Patricia Anderson, her four children, and a family friend were in a car, stopped at a stoplight. A drunk driver rear-ended them, and the back bumper pierced the gas tank, and a horrific explosion ensued. We were in trial in that case in 1999. In fact, this is the 20th anniversary year of that case, and we discovered and, and proved that General Motors knew about this design defect, and rather than pay $6 per car to fix the defect, they chose to deal with the lawsuits later. The jury returned a verdict there of $4.9 billion with a B, which was at the time the largest verdict in US history. Wow, that is so impressive. And just one of many impressive things that you've done. Um, Carl, when you look at the way that the media and the entertainment industry represents you, do you have any corrections or do you think they're pretty fair? Well, I'm very fortunate because for much of my life when I was working in Johnny Cochran's office, he was always the focus. And Silver, I've always enjoyed being the man who whispered into the ear of the man rather than being the man itself. <laughs> the O.J. Simpson experience though, was an entirely different um, animal altogether. And in 2016, there were two watershed events that really um, reestablished the O.J. thing in an entirely new generation of Americans. One was the 10 part series, The People vs. O.J. Simpson on FX, and the other was an, an, an Academy Award winning documentary made by ESPN entitled O.J. Made in America. The series 
was dramatic. And it was probably 70 or 75% accurate. I was fortunate to be portrayed pretty accurately in that series. The documentary was the real thing. There were real interviews, there were real scenes, there was me talking from the heart. I remember talking probably for five hours and they edited it down to a, to a seven hour documentary. And that was one of the finest things that I ever was involved with. And I, I will be glad because once I'm no longer on this earth, that documentary will forever be out there for, for generations to see. That is really outstanding. I'm glad to know that you authorized that, that you agree with it. Well, Absolutely now tell me so. something. What would the 14-year-old Carl Douglas think of the Carl Douglas today? Have you reached your expectations? You know, I'm always a positive thinker. I always believe that the glass is half full. And I always believe that my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has more things for me just around the corner. Silver, I've been a lawyer for 38 years. And I've just this past three months been involved with three new cases that will, I think, continue to forward the legacy of Carl Douglas. So I believe the future is now and continuing on for me. That's Let me tell you about these cases. The most important one involves my representation of the family of Jonathan Hart. Jonathan Hart was a 20 year old African American gay homeless man. And he and two friends went into Walgreens. Now you gotta understand that Walgreens is the largest retail company in the world. They made $131.5 billion last year. They've had a problem with shoplifting for years. And the executives at Walgreens decided to, to have two different strategies to deal with what they call loss prevention. One was to install cameras in their stores. And another was to place armed security guards in some of those stores. In Los Angeles County, there are 54 Walgreens stores. Only four of those 54 stores have armed guards. Those four stores are in the black community, the brown community, and the homeless community that is predominantly black and brown. You see, in that's Los outrageous. Angeles, that's outrageous. In Los Angeles, Silver, there are 55,000 homeless people in Los Angeles, second only to New York City. And 7,000 of those homeless adults are between the ages of 15 and 25. They tend to congregate in Hollywood, where there's a very progressive community, and they cater to homeless youth. On December the 2nd, 2018, Jonathan and his two friends went into that store after being in the store shopping and minding their own business, they were profiled by the armed security guard there. The security guard walked up to Jonathan and he was offended by being followed around the store and he complained. The security guard got into Jonathan's face and Jonathan pushed him away. The security guard pushed Jonathan back and Jonathan turned to walk out the door. The security guard then took out his firearm, told Jonathan to freeze, and shot him once in the back of the neck as he was trying to walk out the door. We have a campaign, boycott, hashtag boycott Walgreens, and hashtag M-A-S-A, -A, make America safe again. We want to hit Walgreens where it hurts in its pocketbook because these are despicable racist decisions to arm guards at only four of 54 stores. Silver, Walgreens doesn't sell electronics. 
They don't sell jewelry. They have alcohol that is kept under lock and key expensive bottles. So for them to have an armed guard in the store is despicable. And for that guard to violate his training by shooting an, an unarmed man in the back who was trying to move away is absolutely outrageous. It really is. We're seeking $525 million for the death of Jonathan Hart. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but if you make $131 billion, 500 million is less than one half of 1%. And I found the only way you can make a big corporation change its despicable policies is by hitting them in the pocketbook where it hurts. That is a case that I have been training 40 years of my life for, and I will not be deterred in my efforts to bring justice to the Jonathan Hart family. Well, I'm really happy that you feel that way, Carl. That's absolutely outrageous. And that a man could be killed for shoplifting and on a racial basis, those are really horrible. But, but, you're it was, but, but, but the most important thing was he wasn't even shoplifting. He wasn't when even he, shoplifting. When he died, the detective said he had his California ID card in his hand. I saw what, that. What kind of shoplifter ever has an ID card in his hand? What kind it's of shoplifter outrageous. should be executed? Of course. <laughs> I mean, but come the, on. And the, like shoplift, the shoplifting is the Walgreens spin to try to blemish the spirit and the memory of Donovan Hart. It is outrageous, and we're going to fight that. Yeah, they're also capitalizing on an African-American stereotype of blacks as thieves. So Absolutely they're trying to so. sell that, that, well, we're all thieves. And the outrageous part about it is the cop, the security guard that shot him was never handcuffed that night, was never taken to custody that night. You're kidding. I, I dare say, Silver, if that had been a black guard who shot a white patron in the store, they would have thrown him under the jail. Well, for me to get used to murdering shoplifters, that's a little extreme. No trial, no evidence, you just can shoot him? He was the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Is he in prison now? He's not in prison now. He, he was been charged with second degree murder. We have an African-American district attorney in Los Angeles, a female named Jacqueline Lacey, and she did have the strength of character to charge him 10 days ago with second degree murder, and he currently is in jail under a $3 million bail. Wow, well that's good news at least. Do you Absolutely. think that there is any kind of future, uh, this question is actually from Carol Bourne. Carol sure. Bourne was a School of Medill student, advertising major, she was in our class as well. Absolutely, she I remember. wants to ask you, um, is there a future where black people receive justice and fair treatment? I would tell Carol, like I tell young students that I speak to all the time, that I am always optimistic. Justice is a difficult thing to achieve, but with fighters continuing to fight, Hopefully one day we will reach the ideals of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, where a person will not be judged by the color of his skin, but rather by the content of his character. Silver, we are not there yet. Regrettably, we are in a very turbulent time. And with our current administration, it is destined to be more turbulent before it gets better. But I am going to continue to fight, and I hope your listeners continue to push forward, fighting for that lofty goal of justice. Well, thank you. She also wonders how you feel the justice system is working for Black people. Is it working well? Um, as an African-American lawyer, it is regrettable that the justice system does not always generate fair justice. And as much as there are injustices based on racial grounds, 
There are also injustices based on financial grounds. If you look at any jail in any urban metropolitan area in the country, you will find undoubtedly that most of the people that are still in jail facing charges are there because they cannot afford enough money to hire a lawyer and to get out on bail. So as much as racism is still a fundamental aspect of our criminal justice system, capitalism as well is another barrier for equal justice for all. Good point, good point. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your case with um, Ms. Abdullah, Professor Abdullah? Oh, I'm glad that you've asked. I represent Dr. Melina Abdullah. She is the leader of the Black Lives Matter movement here in LA. She is the head of the Department of Pan-African American Studies at Cal State University, Los Angeles. She's a bad, bad sister. <laughs> we, we in Los Angeles have a terrible history of bad relations between the police department and the black and brown communities in Los Angeles. Every Tuesday, there are meetings from the Los Angeles Police Commission. That's a five person civilian body that oversees the work of the LAPD. And every Tuesday, Black Lives Matter leaders attend those meetings often on behalf of the families of black and brown men who have been shot and killed by LA police officers. Dr. Molina is not one to just sit there quietly and listen. She will often advocate on behalf of families because BLM in Los Angeles will go to the families of anyone who is shot by the police and assist them. They'll hold a vigil for them. They'll take them and help them walk through the system and they'll provide sort of a family environment. Endemic of the old African saying that it takes a village to raise a child. At these commission meetings, she will often be disruptive. She will often protest and she'll often do things that will get into the face of the five commissioners. Our case is because she's been charged with eight counts of disrupting private meetings. These are occasions when she and other white activists as well would be, would be escorted out of the meeting and handcuffed. We have three different dates where she was escorted out, others were escorted out. She was handcuffed, others were handcuffed. But surprisingly, only she was charged not the other white women, not the other Indian men who were also charged with her, arrested with her. So we think the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office and City Attorney Mike Fuhr are trying to criminalize black protest. So we are fighting that fight on her behalf. Well, that's wonderful to hear. That was very unjust what, they, what they've done to her. And adding those new charges, char charges to her uh, account as well. Well, not only was she being charged with disrupting the meetings, but as importantly, she's been charged with assault and battery on a police officer. And that is what is most disturbing. You see, Dr. Molina is a strong advocate of the teachings of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. She has a, a class at Cal State LA called Black Power, where she talks about the Black Power movement and the importance of nonviolence. She has always preached nonviolence. And we will be able to prove, Silver, that the Los Angeles Police Department are lying when they say that she grabbed a cop's arm and he had to fling his arm away to get away from her grasp. When that happened, there was another white woman who said, Melina didn't grab her, I grabbed her. The next Tuesday, that white woman said, Melina didn't grab her, I grabbed him. Yet and still, she was prosecuted for assault and battery and the white woman was never charged. 
Are you her defense attorney? I am one of a team of seven lawyers. All of us are volunteering our time in the name of justice, representing this woman who is an inspiration to me every day of my life. She is the reason I became a civil rights lawyer. No, are you joking? Well, I'm saying battles such as this. Yeah, oh, where, I see. Where the power structure is trying to- Because I think she's, she's younger. Isn't she younger? She's, 40, she, she's, 40, she's in the mid 40s. But yeah. when the power structure tries to criminalize black protest, that is the, the challenge that I've always vowed to fight for my 40 years as a lawyer. Wow, that is wonderful and so necessary. Carl, Indeed do you think that police abuse in the United States is going down from, uh, let's say, three years ago? Well, I'll tell you, Silver, the best thing about police community relations is the advent of technology. <laughs> yeah. It started with Rodney King in 1992 when a man had a camera, a big old camera, and decided to videotape a commotion. I dare say, had that man not had that camera, Rodney King would have been in jail today because there were 14 officers present who watched that horrific beating and never mentioned it in their police reports the next day. Now, wow. in Los Angeles, for example, every police officer is equipped with a body-worn camera. In the county of LA, the sheriff's department are now having dashboard cameras and body-worn cameras. And the cameras are now the elixir that is going to rid this country at one point of these horrific instances of officer-involved misconduct. So it is not getting better, but with cameras, the future is bright because they will not be able to hide in the shadows of the code of silence. Trust me when I say, the code of silence is alive and very much well in Los Angeles and throughout this country. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Carl, where did you grow up? I was raised in Los Angeles. I went to public schools here. I then went to college at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. You know, Silver, I had never seen snow before becoming an 18 year old kid moving to Chicago. And I dare say, after spending four years there, I said, I'll go to law school anywhere except where it snowed. <laughs> so I applied, I applied to nine <laughs> schools in California and I settled on the UC Berkeley Law in Berkeley, California. I, I was in law school there and then I went back to Washington, D.C to work for the Federal Communications Commission. I was hired under Jimmy Carter in 1980, but in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president. And much like the difference between the Republican Trump and Barack Obama, when Reagan was elected, the whole tenor of government changed. The reason that I wanted to use government to help the people changed. And so I was there only a year and I came back to Los Angeles, began working at the Federal Public Defender's Office. I was there for five years. I then worked in Johnny Cochran's office for 12 years and I've been on my own for the past 23 years. I see. Carl, what did Johnny Cochran think of you? What did he tell you about yourself? Why did he pick you? It's funny. I have on my wall in my office a picture of all of the lawyers in the O.J. Simpson case. There were 12 of us, and it is the one and only picture that was autographed by every member of the team. Johnny said to my main man, Carl, who always made me look good. And that is the highest compliment that he could ever give.
because wow. I didn't always want to be the man up front. I'm kind of shy, believe it or not. But I like to be the man whispering into the ear of the man and trying to help him do great things for the world. So for Johnny to recognize that in me and to bring me on as one of his lawyers to make me the managing attorney of his office indeed said it all in terms of the trust and the faith that he placed in me. It sure does. It sure does. And look what you've done with it. I mean, it's, you really parlayed it into to even more success. You could have rested on your laurels. What well, it, go It's funny, though, because I was a 30-year lawyer in the O.J. Simpson, I mean, 40, no, but Simpson trial, 40-year lawyer. So there was a whole lot of living still for me to do. Well, that's, that's true. And so, so achieving is just a part of who you are. Let me ask you this. When did you first realize, and don't be modest, Carl, when did you first realize that you were going to be great? Don't be modest. I'll tell a couple of things. One, I have wanted to be a lawyer since I was 14 years old. I have in my house now a ninth grade yearbook where I got out of junior high school in the ninth grade, going to high school. And my friends wrote then, good luck, Carl, you'll make a great lawyer. Wow. So I always knew then that I was destined for something special. You know, Silver, since I was nine years old, every day of my life, I've read a physical newspaper. Except when I was in college, we couldn't get newspapers. Every day of my life, even today, I go out to my front yard, pick up my newspaper, come in and read the newspaper. And I attribute my absolute insistence of reading a paper every day as the single greatest reason why I am who I am today. Now, I'm over 40, so I don't read the paper online. I've never heard that time. before. You don't read the paper online, but you think the newspaper is the most important tool? I read a physical paper in my hand every single day. And I, re I turn every page of the paper every single day. I don't read every article, but I read about the, about the uprisings in Venezuela. I read about the problems in Taiwan in the world section. I read about people being shot in Florida. I read the opinion sections of conservatives and liberals alike. I read about things going on in Chicago and in Florida and in New York. I'm a sports fanatic. My passions are sports and law. I'm a competition fiend. And so being a trial lawyer really speaks to who I am as a person. It's funny because for me, Silver, 80% of law is uninteresting. <laughs> but when I can put it in the context of a trial and I can get my competitive juices boiling, that to me is fun. So I probably will never retire. I'll probably be a lawyer until my last breath on earth. But I love it and I'll continue always doing it. Well, that is wonderful, and you do it very well. Do you ever get discouraged? Certainly. How I do you lost, handle it? What do you do when you get discouraged? I lost my last two trials against police officers in LA, and there are few things more discouraging than that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I tell my, when I tell my staff, you have one day to, to grieve and feel sorry for yourself. After we lose, I take off, I go down to the marina, and I watch the sailboats go and chill out. And then I dust myself off, I pick myself up, 
and I get back in because there's another client who deserves my absolute focus and attention for their case. So I don't have time to dwell on my losses. That's the game of life. But you always push forward, stay positive, and keep the Lord close to your heart. Push forward, stay positive, keep the Lord close to your heart. That's excellent advice. There's just one more case I want to ask you about, and, and then we'll, we'll probably close out. And we talked about Jonathan Hart and, and Dr. Abdullah, but there's another case as well. Do you want let to me talk tell you, about it? Let me, let me tell you about that. That involves a tragedy that happened August 26, 2018. There's an entire industry of people that are gamers on computers and they play NFL John Madden. Silver? Yes. They, have, they hire arenas and 25,000 people will come and pay money and sit in an arena and watch people play video games. Esports. It's an amazing industry that I knew nothing about. I have a 27 year old kid and my kid says, see dad, I told you I could make money playing video games. <laughs> But on that day, there was a tournament in Jacksonville, Florida. Hundreds of gamers came for the weekend tournament. A person named Terry beat this guy on a Saturday. You had to lose two times to be kicked out of the tournament. Elijah Clayton, a 20-year-old kid who had been a gamer all his life, who was the fifth best rated gamer by EA Sports played that same guy on a Sunday. He beat him on Sunday. That guy went out to his car, picked up a, black, a, a, a backpack, went back into the, the, the restaurant and shot 26 people, wow. killing two. I represent the family of Jonathan, of Elijah Clayton, the mother, Erin Reed of Elijah Clayton. I saw her just Tuesday in my office, mm. and I vowed that her son's memory would not go in vain because there was not a single security guard at the restaurant of that tournament. They had not even told the mall that they were going to have a tournament where the public and hundreds of people would come in. There were 26 people who were shot and injured. The gunman turned the gun on himself. So we are suing EA Sports. We are suing the restaurant. We are suing the mall for hundreds of millions of dollars so that we can get the attention of EA Sports. That's a billion dollar industry and they owe it more to their gamers than the level that they showed on that day. You want them to provide more security in those places? Is that they're, why they're uh, negligent? Particularly in this age of young men, predominantly white, who have a passion for guns. There was a tragic shooting just yesterday in Florida of a white gunman going into a bank and killing five people in the bank. This fascination with guns in America must stop. And the only way we can make it stop silver is by hitting corporations in the pocketbook where it matters most to them. I urge your listeners to join the challenge and to make corporations keep up with their mantle of providing safety to people who come within their doors. Well, that's exciting. So you've got three big cases on right now and they're all very um, important, critical issues. Um, would you categorize, you? so you do categorize yourself as a civil rights lawyer, right? I am a civil rights lawyer. At this you can, point. You can do good and do well at the same time. I rep these are three cases, but I represent 70 different families who all have been injured due to the wrongful conduct or the negligence of someone else. My firm, Douglas Hicks Law, is duty bound to help these families put their lives back together, both emotionally and economically. We're a team of four lawyers. 
and we are duty bound to do all we can to make lives better one family at a time. Well, thank you, Carl. That's wonderful. Um, well, I think we learned a lot more about you. I want to thank you so much for making the time to, to be with me today and talk to me about what it takes to be great. There's just no denying that you are great, and I'm so happy to be a part of bringing that out to other people for you. Well, so, let me tell you, let me tell you, listen, Mr. Silver, I've known you for 40 years. Yep. You look as good as you did as a freshman in college. <laughs> and continue doing the great work that you're doing for America. Thank you. You know, I love our people and always want us to look how we look, not how they want us to look. Absolutely. So thank you for your thing about literacy, too, that you talk about reading the newspaper every day. Now, that's one of my big pushes. So let me just end with that. How important is literacy? You've already said that you read the paper and it starts your day and forms your life. Being able to read, being able to write, being able to understand complex material. Has that been the golden key for you, Carl? Yes. Reading and writing well have been the two tools that I have always leaned on that are the reasons I am the lawyer and the person that I am today. Education is power. Once you get it, no one can ever take it from you. So read, write, and become informed. Thank you. Well, that was Carl Douglas. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on What It Takes to Be Great.